Morning, everyone. Let's pray together as we come to God's word. Psalm 63 says, So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because of your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, we we know that we're looking into your sanctuary. Help us, Father, open our eyes to behold your glory and your power. May we see your steadfast love in Christ is better than life itself. And may our lips praise you as a result of what we read and hear today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I wonder, do you ever struggle with the unimpressiveness of church sometimes? You know what I mean. You'd love to invite more people to, to come and hear the gospel, but at the back of your mind, you're you're hesitant, you're slightly embarrassed to ask because, well, you're inviting them to a fairly unimpressive place, a church hall, to meet a bunch of friendly but fairly unimpressive people, especially me at the front, doing fairly unimpressive things, you know, a Bible talk, some songs, some prayers. To hear about a king who was crucified, naked, on a Roman cross over 2,000 years ago. It just sounds so unimpressive. And while we, and, and after a while, we get so discouraged, we kind of feel like giving up on the whole reaching out thing. Or maybe you're looking into Christian things and and it's brilliant you're here, that's why we're here, to help people look at the claims of Jesus. But the church seems so unimpressive. Is, it, is that a reason maybe not to pursue things any further? It, it, if I tell all my friends I've become a Christian, are they going to just laugh at me? Unimpressive. Well, if we've ever felt like that, and, and maybe you're feeling it right now, I think today's passage in Hebrew, uh, Haggai 2 is really going to help us. Because uh, back then, God's Old Testament people were feeling in so- something incredibly similar. So back in chapter 1, they'd restarted the building of the temple in Jerusalem under the preaching of Haggai. Brilliant. But now, less than one month on, according to verse 1, they were so discouraged that they were ready to give up. Why? Simple. Because the new temple wasn't a patch on the old temple. The old temple which, which Solomon had built in, in his lavish kingdom, but which got destroyed in the exile. This new one seems so pathetic, so unimpressive compared to the old one. And maybe they were thinking to themselves as they sweated away building the new temple in the hot Middle East sun, what's the point? It's never going to be as good as the old one. It's pathetic. Morale morale was crumbling fast. So in verse 2, God sends his prophet Haggai to speak his words, to address not just the leaders this time, but all the people. Verse 3, God asks, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Maybe no one had the heart to say it, but God knew his people's hearts. He addresses those who are old enough to remember the glory of the old temple, and he says, I know how you're feeling. I know what you're thinking. That this new temple is nothing compared to the old one. That that word nothing literally means zero or naught. I know you're discouraged and demoralized and feel like giving up. I know. In fact, they've been feeling like this for a very long time. We read back in Ezra chapter 3 that when the initial foundation of the new temple was laid, it was so unimpressive that the older men who remembered Solomon's old temple wept. They wept at the same time that the young men were rejoicing. They wept because they remembered just the glory of the old temple, and this new one was nothing in comparison. 
And, and now rebuilding just seemed to bring all those painful feelings back again. So we come to our key verse, verse 4, which contains the main application for us today. Verse 4, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. Do you get the tone? God is being as tenderly encouraging to his people as he possibly can. I love how he says, be strong uh, to each, each one, almost by name. Be strong, O Zerubbabel, civic leader. Be strong, O Joshua, religious leader. Be strong, all you people of the land. By addressing them by name, it comes with a kind of particular uh, love and encouragement, doesn't it? If I were to address you uh, this morning by name, I think you'd be like, oh, I think he means me. And that's why the title of this talk is Be Strong. Be strong. But what does that mean? Well, I think we're given a, a clue at the end of verse 4 when God says, the very next sentence, work for I am with you. So be strong means keep working, keep building the temple, don't give up. And if you're a Christian believer here today, it's like God is saying to you and to me by name, be strong, keep building, don't give up. I know the church doesn't look impressive to the world, that it's nothing in their eyes, says the Lord, but keep working. And again, I think this is a timely message for us at this stage in our church life. For the last 20 years, we've kind of been in Haggai 1 territory. Uh, we made a, a great start. We got building. But now as we transition into this next uh, chapter in Lions Down's history, having lost our previous building, maybe with that nagging sense that as we build back, things aren't as good as they used to be. We don't look as impressive as we once did. Well, we need to hear this message, don't we? Be strong. Keep building. Don't give up. Well, maybe it's not the unimpressiveness of the church that discourages you, but the unimpressiveness of ourselves. Maybe over the last year of lockdowns, your health has taken a massive hit. You're a lot weaker physically than you used to be. Maybe things have been crazy at work and you get to the end of the week and you just feel like you've got nothing left in the tank to serve God. Maybe it's just an ongoing awareness of our own weakness and brokenness and sinfulness that makes us think, did God have me in mind when he pictured a perfect builder or his church today? Does he, I'm such a wretch, I don't even know if God wants me to be building at all. I remember uh, when I used to lead Romsey 3, um, I know it's called Rygate 2 now, uh, a Christian summer camp for, for, uh, for kids. Um, as, as the week approached, I mean, it was lots of hard work and, and preparation, all that kind of thing. Um, but people used to ask me, uh, Mark, how are you feeling about camp? They kind of expected me to say, yeah, I'm really excited, I'm, I'm pumped, I'm ready to go. But more often than not, I would say, to be honest, I'm feeling really weak. And if any of that's us this morning, then we need to hear the message of Haggai 2. Be strong, don't give up, keep building the church. You know, people often say that the hardest thing in life is to make a start. But you know, I think that's just complete rubbish. On my shelves at home, I've got loads of books that I've made a start at reading. I got to chapter 1 and chapter 2 and then I didn't get any further. Now, it's easy to make a start. What's hard is to keep going, especially when you feel discouraged. It's the same, isn't it, with diet and exercise. Easy to start, hard to keep going. And God knows that too when it comes to the building of his church. 
That's why he's given us Haggai 2. Be strong, he says. But the question is, how do we be strong? When the church looks so unimpressive, when I look so unimpressive, how can I be strong? feels like an impossible command. Well, from this passage, we see two huge reasons why we can. Firstly, God's presence. This is the second half of verse 4 and verse 5. It says, Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. I am with you. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. Are not these the most wonderful words to hear? In fact, we saw this idea last week, didn't we? That as they obeyed God's command to rebuild the temple, he promised that he would be with them. I love the fact that God says here that my spirit remains in your midst. Did you notice that? He's saying, look, I never abandoned you to work in your own strength. I never will abandon you to work in your own strength. My spirit remains in your midst, empowering you for my work. Same is true for us today. You know, Jesus said it's that as we make disciple makers, as we build his church, that's when we experience the the presence of God in our lives, the encouragement of God. The presence of God by his spirit who dwells not just in our midst, but in our very selves. That's why we have nothing to fear, fear not. And why will his spirit never abandon us? Well, verse 5 gives us the clues. Because of the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. A covenant simply means a promise or agreement. For, for God's Old Testament people then, it was the old covenant that God made with them when he rescued them out of slavery from Egypt. But for us today, it's the new covenant sealed in Jesus' blood when he rescued us, not out of slavery to Egypt, but out of slavery to sin. This new covenant now guarantees God's presence by his spirit to, for all his people as we build his church. That's why he will never abandon us. Imagine I uh, started my own business. Uh, I imagine that would be a, a, quite a terrifying prospect, you know, risk, uh, hard work, um, scary. But now imagine that I had Lord Sugar, you know, that guy from The Apprentice, uh, saying to me, go for it, Mark, because I am with you. I'm going to back you 100%. I'm going to give you all the resources you need. When you're discouraged, I'm going to encourage you. When you fail, I'm going to help pick you up. I think, I'd, I think I'd be like, great, let's go. But how much more when God, says, when God says to us, work for I am with you. Build my church. I will back you 100%. I will give you all the resources you need. I will not let this building project fail. So that's the first reason that we can be strong, because of God's presence, especially when we're weak. Second reason why we can be strong is, number two, because of God's power. This is verses six to nine. Let me read them. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. <laughs> Despite appearances totally against the run of play, God makes the most extraordinary promise to his people here in Haggai 2. In verse 9, he says, One day this new temple will far surpass the old one in glory. I will fill this house with glory. You, you can imagine Haggai's first hearers hearing this, uh, this promise and, and kind of looking at Haggai finally and, and 
thinking, uh, Haggai, have you seen the new temple? It's not a patch on the old one. How on earth is it ever going to be more glorious than the last one? I mean, look at it. It's pathetic. Can we believe this? Well, yes, because of who has made the promise. Did you notice five times in just these three verses, it says that the Lord of hosts will do it. The Lord of armies. We saw this last week, didn't we? And when he says it, he is going to make it happen. I will do this, says the Lord of hosts. But how is this ever going to happen? Well, in these verses, God says he's going to do something amazing in power. He's going to shake the nations. And the treasures of the nations will flow into the temple. It's a bit like um, if, you, if you shake a tree that's full of ripe fruit, the, the fruit kind of falls to the ground, doesn't it? Well, God is going to shake the nations and the treasures of the nations will come into the temple. Is this stealing? Well, no, because verse 8, all the silver and gold belong to God anyway. He's only getting what belongs to him. And in this glorious new temple, did you notice, he will give peace to those who come. What an amazing promise. God is going to move in a new and powerful way. He's going to fill his temple with, with glory, according to Haggai, with treasure and peace. But you know what? Those hearing the promise that Haggai made all those years ago, those original hearers never saw it come true. In fact, the temple that they were looking at right then would one day be destroyed again by the Romans. So what of this promise of a glorious new temple? Did God fail to keep his promise? Well, no, because one day, hundreds of years later, in fact, about 500 years later, there would be a man, the Son of God, who would say these words, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. Do you see that this promise in Haggai is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus and his church? But in two stages. In two stages. The first stage that this is fulfilled, this promise in Haggai is fulfilled, is stage one in Jesus and the church in this age, the age we're in. So Jesus fulfilled the promise in Haggai when he came to earth in his first coming, when he died on the cross to bring peace for all who would trust in him. And now as that message of the gospel goes out into the world, it's as if he's shaking the nations. And the treasures of the nations, the people of God, the elect people of God, are coming in to Jesus. They're coming into his church as they trust in him. And he's filling his house with glory as people honor and praise the name of Jesus. Did you know that's, what's God, that's what God is doing in the world today? He's shaking the nations with the gospel. And the people are flowing in. Are you part of that? So this promise in Haggai is fulfilled in one level now, in, in Jesus and the church in this age. But it, on another level, it's not yet ultimately fulfilled. Because that's going to happen when Christ returns. This is stage two, Jesus and the church in the age to come. Because we read in places like Hebrews 12, which quotes this exact promise in Haggai 2 that says that one day this promise is ultimately going to be fulfilled when Jesus returns to judge the world, when he comes to shake the nations for one final time and take his people home to peace and rest forever in heaven and the new creation. Are you ready for that day? Another place in the Bible uh, which points to this fulfillment is Revelation 21. To come with, uh, if you have a Bible... Flip open to Revelation 21. It's right at the end of the Bible. And let me read from verse 22. Another wonderful picture of the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of the promise in Haggai 2. 
Verse 22. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light the nations will walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Do you see the fulfillment? And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Do you see it? This is the church in the age to come. This is ultimately what Haggai foresaw and prophesied those hundreds of years ago. This is the reason that we can be strong and keep building. Keep building the church even when it looks uh, unimpressive and there's nothing in the eyes of the world. Because success is guaranteed. So the next time you're feeling discouraged in the work, maybe setting out the chairs, putting them away again, as you struggle to prepare vineyard studies on Zoom, as you struggle to find time and energy to prepare your Sunday school lessons for the kids, as you struggle to serve your children at home and do Bible times with them and pray with them, be patient with them, or as you struggle to get that vineyard table event off the ground this term, I want you to say to yourself these words from Haggai 2, verse 9. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, and in this place I will give peace. And it might may be that you're not yet a Christian today. You're listening in, and it's great to have you here, as I said. And you're kind of looking at the church in all its unimpressiveness, and you're thinking, is this really the house of the living God? Should I really give my life to Christ and give my life over to the building of his church when it seems there's nothing in the world's eyes? Won't my friends think I've gone mad? Should I really become a Christian? Well, the answer is yes, you should, immediately. Because though it looks weak now, one day Christ will return. Didn't he say that his kingdom is like a mustard seed? that one day will be bigger than all uh, the plants and the birds in the, uh, all the trees and the the birds will rest in its branches. Though it looks weak now, one day Christ will return and this kingdom will be more glorious than you could possibly imagine. Those words of Haggai again, the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former. So don't be fooled by mere appearances. Don't judge a book by its cover. Come to Jesus today. Trust in him. Receive the peace with God that is on offer through the cross. And then join us as we build a kingdom that cannot fail. So in summary, we've seen that the message today is be strong. In other words, keep working, keep going, keep building, especially when the church seems uh, unimpressive. Why? Because firstly, God's presence with us, it's as we work, we experience his power and his presence. His spirit remains in our midst. He's not going to abandon us to work in in our own strength. But secondly, because of God's power, Christ is building his church today. People from all over the world are coming to Christ. And one day, he will return in glory and his church will be transformed and be more glorious than we can possibly imagine. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word to us today. Thank you that when we feel discouraged in the work, You enable us to be strong because of your presence and because of your power. Thank you for that wonderful picture of your church in glory when Christ returns, that it cannot fail. And please, would that help us to be strong and keep building 
till that day comes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.